Um, yeah, so we invite uh, speakers who kind of really can help us deepen what we're doing, inform it, uh, kind of bring us further into these ideas. And uh, Richard's work, um, I came across you, it's really only a couple of years ago, maybe on some podcasts, and, uh, and then read a couple of your books. And then you were very kind to send me a copy of the forthcoming book, Embracing the Void, that we talked about last night. And it's, for me, um, a beautiful articulation of some of what we're trying to explore uh, within parotheology. So Richard's going to come up and going to give an overview of the theories of that book, what he's doing within that book. Uh, and then in the next session, we're going to have a conversation. There might be a chance for Q&A here, but um, I'm just saying, Richard, take your time. Tell us the book as much as possible. So don't worry about a Q&A. If we don't get to that in this session, we'll get to it in the next session. So Richard, you want to come up and share? Thank you. Give it a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. I've seen people do this. I've never actually done it, you know, where you lift the mic. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm hoping I can get us through in a reasonable period of time the basic argument of this book, which will spare you from having to buy it, you know, if you really get it. Uh, it is a risky thesis in two immediate senses. One is that it takes off from a particular concept that Lacan introduces uh, in his seventh seminar, uh, the seminar on the ethics of psychoanalysis, the concept is das Ding, the thing. And the thing is directly related, couldn't be more so directly related to what we were talking about last night about unknowing. The thing is essentially a kind of zone of the unknown. Uh, I'll open it up in a second. The second big kind of leap, sort of questionable uh, assumption on my part is to fill in the blank of a general theory of religion which Lacan never presents. In fact, he throws a certain amount of uh, you know, derision in the path of anybody who would try for such a general theory. Um, so he calls it a wastebasket effort, um, thinking that you can't take a single approach to the religious phenomenon. My defense is that, I'll try to lay this out, that it really is important to acknowledge the different ways that different religions deal with the question of the sacred. So I'm gonna try to sketch in very brief both the Greek polytheistic approach, the Judaic approach, and the Christian approach. Whether or not we'll have time for capitalism as religion, which is a chapter I really love, uh, I don't know, but we'll see. The money god might be too far for us to reach in, in today. We'll, we'll see. Uh, a very powerful god, but a very slippery and dangerous one. So uh, these first two points about um, Das Ding and uh, religion, Lacan announces this concept with enormous kind of emphasis, enormous enthusiasm in this 1959-1960 seminar. He basically says, uh, he's picking up on a text of Freud from the early unpublished project for a scientific psychology from 1895. It's just a few pages, but it's an amazing text. Freud says, we have to imagine that the infant, the young, very young child, recognizes two fundamental dimensions of the maternal other. On the one hand, he says, really almost playing before the fact Lacan's theory of imaginary. He says, the infant recognizes through a kind of mirroring the bodily outline of the caretaker. So there's something here that the infant recognizes, a kind of knowledge is, rec is, is registered. However, he says, there's another component of something unknown. The, in the other, the infant finds a kind of question mark. And this, he says, we can only call, this uncognized remainder is das Ding, the thing, the unnameable, the unthinkable. From that, he's going to take the general lesson that the, that, that, that the thing becomes and trying to cognize this undigestible remainder informs all future cognition of objects. 
So the infant there is sort of put on its path to trying to understand the world, encountering some unknowable kernel in everything. As you can imagine, this becomes translated into Lacanese as the kernel of the real. Something unthinkable, unknowable, unimaginable. But something that's basically encounterable everywhere and at every moment. That becomes for me the kind of touchstone of a theory of religion. As you can imagine, this unthinkable ding, this thing, this undigestible, uncognizable something or other, that is the locus of the sacred. But the theory that I try to trot out both tries to lay that proposition out in various examples of various religions, uh, but it also points us in the direction of the symptomatic character that typifies all religious formations. Religion both invites us into a, an encounter with something unknowable, something uncognizable, something of which, say, the tradition of negative theology continues to sort of remind us that what we're dealing with here cannot be compassed in human language or thought. But also, religion always has a kind of symptomatic compromise. So what I want to lay out uh, in the time we have, try to get, see if I can get through the trajectory, is how this theory can be excavated in various religious traditions. The three I'll really concentrate on are Greek polytheism, Judaism, and Christianity. What we're looking for, however, is this trace of dusting, uh, which is already something that we find, according to Lacan, in every entry into language. Part of what the signifier conveys, aside from its semantic content, the meaning, we might say, uh, that is communicated, there's something else always passed on to us, handed over to us, that we don't understand. The simplest way to get this is not actually uh, trivial. It's very profound. Whenever someone says something to you, there's always the question that can arise, oh yes, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but what are you really trying to tell me? What's the subtext of your communication with me? What are you really after? And this dimension of the second guess, you know, that, that sort of wondering what's really being said to you, what is really being asked of you, evokes the dimensions of this concept, das Ding. Lacan abandons this concept to a very large extent after the seventh seminar, which leaves us with a kind of puzzle. He announces it with enormous kind of emphasis and enthusiasm, but he very rarely comes back to it. He does, however, come back to it some. In the following year, the seminar on the transference, the eighth seminar, he adds a new angle. In the seventh, the ethics seminar, he says, das Ding is the secret to our concept of sublimation. In sublimation, the object, he says, the mere thing, the mere object of our perception is raised, he says, to the dignity of das Ding. I take that to mean something like the work of art gives us in sublimation a kind of mysterious excess. So when the landscape is painted, we're not only seeing what lay before the viewer, but we're seeing something that cannot be viewed, a kind of something that escapes us, that transcends whatever we sensorily perceive. In the following year, he comes back to the problem of sublimation and he says, das Ding is part of a kind of defense against, uh, I'm sorry, that the, the beautiful sublimation is a kind of defense against das Ding. In his first iteration in the seventh seminar, he says, das Ding is evoked by the art object. 
in the next year, he says, the art object covers over dusting. The beautiful is kind of like a band-aid, a kind of shield that protects us against exposure to this thing. Already we're getting the notion that dust ding is the object of ambivalence par excellence. And this goes back to the thing we were just talking about last night. Someone helped me with this. I can't, don't see her in the moment. Where is she? <laughs> hey, there you are. Uh, perfect, perfect. So this, uh, this idea that the thing is not only daunting, threatening, uncanny, but it's also the kernel, the core of the impulse Lacan calls désir. We, we can't but be attracted to this unknown thing. So it is, you might say, the object of ambivalence par excellence, of hot and cold push and, and pull, of attraction and repulsion, of desire and terror. It's something of the real. Our relationship to it, therefore, is always fraught. You may be already able to sense that this allows me to frame the core claim of the whole book, embracing the void. In one way or another, the religious impulse, as I analyze it, is a relationship to this uncanny, threatening, overwhelming, and deeply ambivalent relation we have with das Ding, the unknown, the unthinkable. It works, however, differently in different religions. And we can now uh, go through them and open up the differences, which turn out to be fascinating. And they also correlate, as we'll see, with the three cardinal <coughs> Lacanian categories, the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real. One of the ways in which I became most kind of addicted to this question and sort of felt I really had to, to tackle it was an offhand remark of Lacan in 1974. He's being interviewed by some Italian journalists and he remakes the remark that there is one true religion and only one true religion. And that, he says, is the Roman religion. The one true religion is Christianity. <laughs> it's kind of like, what? This came out of the mouth of a psychoanalyst? The one true religion? I mean, this already is a phrase you can't imagine a psychoanalyst uttering. But then to pick Christianity of all religions seems just mind-boggling. I mean, you, people have wondered whether or not this was Lacan's attachment to his brother, uh, who was a Benedictine monk. Maybe Lacan has this kind of weird... Christian hangover that he can't shake. It's in any event an incredibly uh, vexing and puzzling remark. And what I want to try and lay out today, hopefully we can get through the trajectory, is to say in what sense is, does he mean this? It turns out it is meaningful, I think, but in a very weird way. He also says something weird about Greek polytheism the kind of single line that could be taken as my entry into an a analyzing Greek polytheism is the following also very weird statement. He says, the gods are a means by which the real is revealed. That's a bizarre statement also if you're familiar with Lacan's idea of the real. The real is precisely what cannot be represented what cannot be apprehended or cognized. So what is he talking about? The real is revealed in the Greek pagan gods. I think the key to this is that in a sense, Greek polytheism does turn the unthinkable pure force of the real into something imaginary. That is to say, Zeus becomes the personification of the thunderbolt, which is kind of unimaginable. This kind of flash, this blast, this roar, this unthinkable impact is then thought to be this kind of surly old dude. Or uh, any of the Greek gods, we could uh, 
treat in this way uh, the god Poseidon, the god of tide and storm and earthquake and so on. Apollo, the god of light, the god of music, Dionysus, the god of wine. All these, of course, are enormous forces. And we're giving them a kind of image, even a kind of face. So the real is here being translated, yes, into imaginary figures. So the real is revealed, quote unquote, but only in these kind of imaginary mock-ups. How then does the pagan worship life <coughs> unfold? One is relating to the unthinkable powers that hold us in suspense, that may at any moment snuff us out, and we continue to offer sacrifices to these ultimately unseeable powers upon which we depend by properly showing these powers our obeisance, our respect, etc. You might say it ends up being this gigantic game that we play with the mortal powers, the ones that control our fates and at any moment may snuff us out in a, in a blink. We uh, relate to them through this kind of pantheon of imaginary characters, really a, almost a kind of comedic tableau. You could translate this into uh, Hegel's great distinction early on in the phenomenology between force and appearance. That's what's at stake. Unimaginable, unthinkable, uncognizable force. Force that has no image. But we grant it one through appearance, through giving it a kind of, you know, image in which we can relate to it. But we know that behind that is something unimaginable, pure force. So there we get this first take of a religion that is centered on dusting. It does ding is the pure force, itself unthinkable, that all of the pantheon of gods represent. What then happens in Judaism? Where is das Ding? You can probably already guess. Das Ding appears directly to Abraham. Yahweh is almost amazingly appropriate for this Lacanian concept. This enigmatic being who confronts Abraham and confronts him with almost a comically absurd deal. I will bring from you a great nation and all you have to do is give me that useless flap of skin on the end of your dick. It's kind of like, really? <laughs> That's it? <laughs> I mean, it's almost as though the Torah here is giving us das Ding in a kind of caricature, a kind of cartoon, something unthinkable. It replays itself, of course, in Moses' confrontation with the burning bush. The burning bush, you could say, is das Ding right in front of us, challenging us with we don't know what. It's, I think this is one way, really interesting way to interpret the exchange of Abraham and Yahweh. It's absurd, of course. It almost has to be absurd because what Yahweh is asking is unthinkable. Also really interesting is Yahweh means to lay down the law. But notoriously, the law is simply stated, not explained. You must simply do this, 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 this. And by the time the Jews are finished elaborating the halakhic regime of laws, we've got over 600 of them. It's kind of like the compensating factor for this amazing, direct confrontation with what is unknown in the other the other with a capital O, which remains 
threateningly, overwhelmingly obscure. The counterpoint, the stabilizer, you might say, is precisely this enormously elaborated regime of Jewish law. It's, though, it's as though, it is as though the real here is not being stabilized by the imaginary, as it was with the Greek pagan religion, but by this really striking elaboration of the symbolic. The author of the law and the meaning of the law remain to be determined, a kind of vestige that's haunted by the real. So Judaism becomes this religion in which ceaseless contestation of the law becomes the heartbeat of civilization. To be a civilized person, to be a Jew in the true meaning of the word means to participate in this kind of unending debate about what are we truly asked to obey? What is the true meaning of the law? And this, of course, becomes unending. It also becomes, I make something of this in the book, I think it's a valuable contribution, and not by any means, however, mine alone, that this dedication to ceaseless self-interrogation with regard to the law sharpens the intelligence of this civilization to an almost unparalleled acuteness that the Jewish uh, people are intellectualizing to an extraordinary extent. At one point, I, I can't give you the exact figures off the top of my head, but at one point I, I talk about how many of the Nobel Prizes in the history of the prize have been won by Jewish thinkers. They are 0.2% of the world's population, but they have over 20% of the Nobel Prizes. It's an astonishing record. And it seems to me you can tr at least relate, this doesn't end all questions on this front, but you can at least relate this extraordinarily, extraordinary intellectuality of the Jewish tradition and people to this relation with this enigmatic God who leaves them with the question about what the laws laid down by Yahweh really mean. So uh, from this point of view, if the Greek pagan tradition was really a f relation to the real by means of the imaginary, Judaism, I interpret following Lacan, filling it in, you might say, filling in like a blank that Lacan rather uh, uh, tantalizingly leaves mostly unexplicit. The Jewish tradition takes up our relationship with the unthinkable as a function of the symbolic. And as we've seen, and it's all through Lacan, I talk a lot about this as I devote a couple of chapters to it, how the symbolic is always touching upon, opening to a limited extent, you might say almost a manageable extent, opening on the real opening on what we don't yet know. So what is Christianity? What is the meaning then of this very bizarre comment from 1974? Near the end of his life, Lacan is 73 at the time he utters this, this statement. What does it mean that Christianity could in any way be claimed to be the one true religion? Well, here to get this this is the point where I'm furthest out on a limb, it seems to me. All my chips, you might say, are sort of on this square. To understand what the move I make here, we have to go back to Dusting. We have to say, remind ourselves, Dusting, the uncognizable dimension of the other person, the fellow human being, the Nebenmensch, as Freud says, is what we encounter in every person. 
one um, playful but kind of instructive little image might be this one. You've seen it dozens of times. It's a cinematic cliche, but one we kind of can't resist. It's the doorknob. There's the frame with the doorknob. And suddenly, the doorknob turns. Someone outside the door is turning the handle. And we're just seeing the motion. Of course, what's being announced is, A, there's someone out there. There's someone on the other side of the door. But B, crucially, they want something. <laughs> and we don't know what it is. Therefore, this is the perfect horror movie clip. The focus on the motionless doorknob, which then <gasps> trembles and turns. And we think, oh God, what next? Of course, of course, we're both dreading it. And we're also eager to see it. It's like, wow, this is going to be great. On the other side of the door, Lacan would say, is dusting. The thing that is the dimension of the real, the unknowable, the threatening, in every fellow human being. The object, back to your excellent comment of last night, the object of, the ultimate object of ambivalence. We're both terrorized by dusting, destabilized by it. It's the ultimate object of anxiety. Here in the 10th seminar, the seminar on anxiety, Lacan returns to dusting. He only returns to it after the seventh seminar a few times. One of the great enigmas of, in my view, Lacan's teaching. This key idea he comes up with, so suggestive, he very rarely returns to it. He seems to almost drop it. Maybe later we can speculate a bit about why he drops it. The main reason, to lift the curtain a little bit, the main reason, I think, is its function is mostly taken over by his later concept of the objet A. From ding to petit A. That's a tough transition, however. I think it's actually quite informative to go back to the original formulation of das Ding, precisely because it focuses us on this problem of ambival ambivalence. We're both attracted and rep repelled we're both in anxiety and horror in the face of this unknown, but we're also impossibly attracted to it. Why? It would seem that the anxiety part is much more intelligible than the attraction part. The answer to this is actually at the heart of Lacan's entire outlook. We really can take his early phrase to the bank. Human desire is the desire of the other. That means I don't know what I want until I wrestle with the question of what I imagine, emphasis on imagine, what I fantasize the other wants. My own desire is secondary to the discovery of desire in the other, which I initially encounter as a question mark. I fill in the blank, you might say. This means, however, that if I discover something unknown in the other, the thing dimension, the unknown, the threatening even, of the other, I'm attracted to it ultimately because there is something in myself that is inchoate, that's unknown. The pure pressure of my own drive, which has yet no shape. It will take a shape eventually in my fantasies. But the clue for my own formation, my own relation to fantasy, is somehow, you might say, pioneered, discovered in the other. What psychoanalysis does, one might say, is to give you another chance at articulating your own relation to your own desire. Psychoanalysis assumes that you have already been, you might say, 
all too caught up, all too alienated in imagining the desire of the other. And you need actually to sort of reclaim for the first time your own ding, your own dimension of something unknown. Ultimately, therefore, we are, yes, threatened, anxious in the face of this unknown, but we're also ineluctably attracted to it, fascinated by it. So it is the object, as we've saying, of ambivalence par excellence. Okay. Now we can understand why, or from one angle, how it makes sense, this crazy claim that Christianity is the one true religion. If we take the basic teaching of the wandering rabbi who ends up running afoul of the authorities so spectacularly, if we take his teaching to be, you must love thy neighbor as thyself. You must embrace that in the neighbor that you find threatening. This is why, by the way, it's not enough that Jesus gives us the injunction to love thy neighbor. We already find that in Leviticus. Love thy neighbor as thyself. That's already fully Jewish. What we find new in, or largely new, in Jesus' teaching is you love thy neighbor, yes, but I add this, also love thine enemy. Which is the commentary Lacan gives on Freud's assessment of the Christly injunction to love the neighbor. You remember in Civilization and Its Discontents, Freud says, love thy neighbor? You want me to love my neighbor? Any old neighbor? Are you kidding? My love is too special to go spilling it everywhere on every neighbor that shows up. That's virtually everybody. And Lacan says, here Freud misses his own teaching. The problem is not that your love is going to be spread everywhere. The problem is really giving your love, really opening yourself to the other, which means encountering directly das Ding, the unknown, the uncognizable. This is traumatic even with your wife. This is traumatic with anyone. Ultimately, you're being asked to go into the abyss to embrace the void. So the neighbor, says Lacan directly, is always at some level the enemy, the unknown, the threatening. So in this sense, by the way, again, Lacan never spells this out. But my gloss, which I'm hoping is fair to Lacan's intent, at least some of it, is to say that Christianity is the first religion that returns us, you might say, precisely in the very pregnant psychoanalytic sense of the word return, like the return of the repressed, etc. Christianity is the religion that returns us to this primal scene, the relationship, the encounter with what is unknowable in the other, unknowable and anxiety producing. Basically, the message of Jesus is face that that you cannot name and embrace it. That's it. That's your job. That is the will of the divine. That is the encounter with the sacred. The kingdom of God is there wherever two or more of you are gathered. Insofar as you embrace this neighbor, you give yourself directly into the arms of the divine. You effectively are 
the arms of the divine. I am that to you, he says, in effect. Now, obviously, this approach to Christianity, which really boils the Christ teaching down to the injunction that we embrace the neighbor and even the enemy, ignores, you might say, the better part of what has come in the wake of his death, what we call Christian. Which, of course, Paul, the first to write an account of Jesus' life and death, gave us. So a lot of what I have to try to accomplish in a very brief space in this book is to say, here I follow Nietzsche much more than the current, there's a kind of current vogue about how profound Paul was. By the way, I don't totally disagree with that. Paul is a massively impressive thinker who gives us a very complicated inheritance. But I basically think that Nietzsche is right, that Paul is the great betrayer of Jesus. That Paul takes this message which I'm saying is the quintessential Lacanian message, to embrace what you fear, to face directly, so far as you can, the thing in the other, the other thing. Which means, of course, facing the thing in yourself that's also traumatizing. That's it, according to the reading I'm giving it, which, as I say, is the reading that Nietzsche gives it. You remember perhaps that famous phrase of Nietzsche, there was only one true Christian, the guy who died on the cross. It's Paul who really perverts the message. How? By effectively saying, it's not a matter of merely reaching out to embrace that which you are afraid of in the other that love overcomes our fear. Paul says, if you carry out this Christian generosity, this Christian embrace of the other, this kind of giving of oneself in proper sacrifice, imitating his on the cross, then you get an unlimited reward. The payoff is in the next life. Here again, I think I, I follow Nietzsche. I think here, here is actually, this is another book. <laughs> I haven't written this, this one yet. I probably won't live long enough. But Nietzsche is, I think, uh, it's not for nothing that he says the, the, only, the one and only Christian died on the cross. I think Nietzsche is true to his own roots, you know, the son of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a Protestant minister and, and, a, and, a, and the daughter of a, another one. Nietzsche is profoundly, very profoundly, affected by Christianity. That's why he attacks it so much. Does that mean? I guess we're getting near a hot topic. This thing is starting to squeal. <laughs> the very mention of Nietzsche is uh, giving it a problem. Okay, so here, if the Greek polytheism was the re a religious approach to Das Ding with the defense of the imaginary in the vanguard. And if Judaism makes an even more spectacular encounter with something like Das Ding in the burning bush and the, and the figure of this enormously, violently enigmatic figure of Yahweh, but takes refuge in the elaboration of the symbolic law, Christianity from this angle, does deserve to be called the religion of the real par excellence, insofar as it enjoins us to open ourselves without defense to the unknown ding in the other, and by extension, in ourselves. We can't forget that. This is an opening to one's own unconscious, as well as the, the abyssal and dizzying 
anxiety producing in the other. And we also now can see the defensive, we begin to see the defensive posture that the Christian tradition takes up in the wake of the death of its prophet. Ultimately, that defense takes the following extremely interesting form. You could have said in some measured way that Greek polytheism and, Christ and Judaism depended upon belief, certain beliefs. Certainly the belief about the covenant between Abraham and Yahweh, of course. Certain belief, well, it's tough to say the Greeks believed their myths. There's a semi-famous book by a Frenchman named Paul Vane, who it, the title of which is, Did the Greeks Believe Their Myths? And Vane makes a big thing about, oh, there are all these critics, you know, of the myths. He makes a very fundamental mistake in my view. The Greeks didn't believe the myths. They didn't, the myths were not injured because they're incoherent and variable. They're kind of a mess. They, they claim all kinds of stuff because the Greeks weren't interested in the truth of the myths. It was just the imaginary theater of the myths. The more variations, the better because it's all a kind of painted, elaborate tableau that evokes but also conceals something unmanageable, the real of the forces that the gods actually are, the unthinkable forces, the deadly forces. But here in Christianity, something else takes over. Belief with a capital B. It's not an accident that the Nicene Creed begins, I believe. Well, what is belief? I love this little section in the, in, the, in the book. It'll probably be the thing that's critiqued the most by <laughs> commentators. But I, I basically analyze belief in simple terms, but I think valid. We don't stop to say we believe something that's basically credible. We don't say, I believe two plus three is five. No one ever says, I believe that. <laughs> because we all take that as true. In other words, you don't take anything that's established and apply the term belief to it. You only believe something that's seriously in question among different answerers. You only believe something that really actually needs an extra oomph to be credible. Which means there's a kind of extra effort in belief. It's the intellectual enterprise where you really put mm, extra to get it over the top, to get the certainty in belief. But notice what this means. This means that belief is actually implicitly anyway a posture and intellectual commitment that I make implicitly recognizing there are other peoples who reject it. This is where I stand, as Martin Luther says. Here I stand, I can do no other. Here's my rock of faith, my elected belief. Knowing full well, at least implicitly, this is not what other people believe. I define myself against them with my belief. But this, doesn't this mean then that Christianity, insofar as it invests itself in the test of faith as belief, particularly orthodox belief, belief that's been sort of ramped up in its intensity and commitment, this is fundamentally not an intellectual but social enterprise that distinguishes the in-group from the out-group. As you can imagine, this is a way of, in very shorthand, characterizing the whole history of Christian sectarianism. The sort of unbelievable proliferation of denominations that define themselves in terms of one or another belief. This is what we believe. What often goes unrecognized there is, for every we believe, there's another group over there that are heretics. Or at least they don't buy our view. It's not hard to see if Jesus had a second chance, they say he's going to. 
he might come back and say, hey guys, I wasn't trying to talk about the right belief. You only really need to believe one thing, that all that's important is the gesture by which you extend yourself openly, unhesitatingly, with your absolutely open embrace to what most threatens you in the other. Even when you are struck by that other, turn the other cheek, offer again to be the object of, your, of the blow. That's all. That's the whole message. All this belief stuff, I don't know what you're talking about. By the way, you can go to several places in the Gospels where basically Jesus says this. They question him, Master, what, what, what should we believe, et cetera, et cetera. And he basically kind of puts them off and says, well, don't get carried away, you know. So we find then this symptomatic character of the Christian religion, which is especially poignant because it is attacking the very posture from this Lacanian point of view, the quintessential Christly message, which is you have really only one challenge, which is to embrace in the other with love what you fear. That's it. That's the whole game. That's the door to the kingdom of heaven, right here. I am there wherever two or more of you are gathered. It isn't about what you believe. It's about what you embrace. And what you need to embrace, most of all, is this void.